with no further ado, please welcome Governor Scott Walker, who's going to teach us how to help Governor Hogan get reelected. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Kathy, uh, we got a good chance to have a little event before this one uh, to help the Senate campaign. You've got a great candidate for the United States Senate. Uh, I told her my, my neighbor across the Mississippi is Joni Ernst, and she rides a motorcycle. I think a business owner, someone who's worked in the private sector, who understands public service, who's not based in Washington and rides a motorcycle, just like my neighbor Joni Ernst. It'd be nice to have another person like that, Kathy, in the United States Senate. So good luck to you, and thank you all for giving her a lot of support. Although I think we're going to work on getting you to Wisconsin, either before, well, probably after the election, when you win, because I think if you're going to be there, you, you appropriately need to take, we'll get you an up-to-date Harley uh, to go with that, because we got plenty of styles that are made just down the way from me. Not too far from, I've got a 2003 Road King, so that's, people always ask, you know, what do I do to relax? I ride, and as you can imagine with my welcoming committee out in front, uh, what that's like, I wear a full-faced helmet, so the first year I was governor, I'm not riding, and that summer after we had won our, our, all our trials and tribulations, there's nothing more enjoyable than pulling up next to a vehicle that has a recall walker sticker in the back. <laughs> And they don't know the guy next to him with the motorcycle and the full-faced helmet is the guy they're trying to recall. <laughs> I do usually try to go with my troopers because I realized if somehow I tipped over, I wouldn't take my helmet off until I looked at the truck or car to see whether they'd come back to pick me up or run me over a couple times. But uh, I do have to last. Speaking of bumper stickers, you know, we, when we were involved, we, we did what we did within the first two months. Uh, we pushed our, our biggest reform of all, which people ask, you know, explain that. What we did more than anything was really just about taking power out of the hands of the big government special interest and putting it firmly into the hands of the hardworking taxpayers, not the state, but the local level. We, we empowered the people that you elect to be on your city councils and county boards and town boards and village boards and state government to actually run the government instead of the big government union bosses. And that's what we did, but it was interesting that People were so threatened, not just in my state, but eventually it was a few thousand people that were protesting in and around our capital. Some of you remember watching it on, on the news at the time. Eventually, there were over 100, almost 150,000. And they weren't just from my state, they were from all over. But the, the biggest group would come from just down the way in Washington, D.C. In fact, for a while, they would charter planes and bring buses and shuttles and that. And we knew, because they would wear the insignia on their hats and their jackets and everything else to kind of uh, identify what union or what group they were with. And they had such control over the minority. Now, we had just switched, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Before November of 2010, everything in our state was Democrat. Everything. Both U.S. Senators, majority of seats in the House of Representatives, both majorities in the legislature, governor, lieutenant governor, you name it, it was a Democrat state. And we switched everything in that 2010 election. And we knew we had a window of opportunity. And Mitch Daniels, the former governor of Indiana, is one of my best friends, and Mitch said to me, one of the best things you, you can do when you're pushing reform is push it early, because the longer you wait, the more people are going to tell you it's too close to the next election. We can't do that. And the sooner you act, the sooner the voters get to see that your reforms work. And so we did things right away in the first days, and the biggest reform we pushed by February 11th of that year. I remember it well, because we introduced it, and by that night we already had protesters in and around our house and blocked in. They kept growing. But like I said, they came from all over the country. That's why there were so many. But eventually they convinced uh, to try and avoid passage of this bill, 14 of our Senate Democrats, who were then just barely in the minority, to leave the state of Wisconsin. Remember, they went over the state line. They went to Chicago and they went down to the clock tower end of Rockford, Illinois. Eventually, after about a month, we worked with some lawyers and, and figured out a way to, to change uh, the way that we did the bill so that it would abide by the Constitution. We passed it and they eventually had to come back. And I remember, and it was good to see your congressman up here, a, a good friend uh, of mine who's in the Congress as well is Sean Duffy, who just was elected in that 2010 election. And, 
Sean and his wife Rachel when I was up in northern Wisconsin at a supper club where there was a packed house inside, but there was a couple thousand outside protesting, many of whom came from Minnesota and Illinois, not just from Wisconsin. But, but Sean gave me one of my favorite bumper stickers of that whole experience. It said, one walker beats 14 runners. <laughs> And you can see, not just what we did in Wisconsin, but you can see why there were part of my welcoming party here today outside. I know a few of you ran into them on the way in. I always say that means I haven't lost my touch. Our reforms are still working. I actually kind of, over the years, particularly when we faced that recall, I almost thought I should bring my own group of protesters along the way, because I, I did an event once in Detroit they were doing a, an event like this, and beforehand they had, they had offered to do a fundraiser to help our recall efforts. And when I came to the Lincoln Day dinner that night, uh, one of the women who had walked in came up and she ripped up a check in front of me. And I thought, boy, what, I didn't even talk yet. What, what did I do wrong? And, and she said, I am so upset. I had to walk through those protesters. I couldn't get in. I got here late because of all that. They were so rude. They were so obnoxious. I'm going to double the size of the check I was going to give you for the recall campaign. <laughs> to which I told my team, we need to bring protesters everywhere. <laughs> and it's kind of like, remember the, some of you aren't old enough to remember this, but I remember the Harlem Globetrotters. They used to have the Washington Generals. Remember, that was the, the traveling team that would, they'd kind of have fun with, but eventually win. I, they're like, those protesters are like the Washington Generals for me. You know, they just kind of go along for the ride. But, but the reason they're out there, and it was so revealing, not just here today, but in you know, all the protests in our state and around the country since then, is because it really, as much as they claim to be for workers and the middle class, they're not. They're frauds. We exposed them. You see, at the height of the debate that we were taking, what we simply wanted, I actually ran ads when I was running for governor that said, you know, we expect public employees when I'm governor to, to pay for pensions and health care just like everybody else does in the state. And, and, get, and, and the, the union leaders, the bosses, love to tell people that we didn't like state workers. I love state workers. I love good, decent, honorable people who want to be public servants just like I love good workers and employees elsewhere out there. I was never picking a fight with the people who wanted to do their job. What I didn't care for were the union bosses that took advantage of them and took advantage of the taxpayers. And so we thought it was realistic at a time when we inherited a $3.6 billion budget deficit from our predecessor to come on out and say, you know, we're going to ask, and I myself paid this as well, so I didn't do anything that I didn't expect of anybody else. We all picked up, we matched our pension contribution, doesn't sound like a radical idea. Matching your retirement contribution. Most people outside of government just expect that, if not even paying more than just matching. I mean, that's a pretty generous deal to match a pretty good retirement system. So we, before that, the oddity was they matched it, but the taxpayers paid both the employee and the employer's portion. Only in government can you figure out a way to say the employees are paying it, but it's actually coming out of the taxpayer's bill on this. And so that's exactly what happened. We said we're going to change it. The other part is we said we expect people to pay a portion of their health insurance premium. Again, not exactly a radical concept. And all we asked for was a minimum of 12.8%, which in our state, probably like Maryland and others across the country, most people in the private sector are paying about double that, uh, if not more, under the so-called Affordable Care Act, which is anything but affordable with Obamacare. But we made those changes. But what was so revealing in all this was at the height of that, the union leaders, who really had no jurisdiction over all these unions at the city and school board level across the state, you know what they did? They offered to pay that. Even though they really can't, they had to be individually negotiated by all the 424 school districts and the 1,800 municipalities and the 72 counties. They did it not just for a PR blitz, but they did it because you know what really frightened them? And I'm convinced today they would have thrown their members under the bus to pay 100% of both retirement and health care because the other thing we did that didn't get as much coverage but is equally if not more important is we got rid of the requirement that public employees had to be in a union and we prohibited them from taking money out of their paychecks to pay for their dues. You see, we exposed not just in Wisconsin but across the country what they're really interested in 
is the taxpayers' money to pay for their dues. They don't care about their members, or by and large they don't. And, and so they were so threatened by this. They didn't just bring in protesters, but they went after six of our state senators the first round in August of 2011. They came back with another four on top of that in June of 2012. And as was mentioned, I was one of only three governors in the entire history of this country who faced a recall, the only one who ever won. Why? Because they were threatened by what we were doing. Now the good news, and why I think your governor come two years from now for, with your help and your dedication is going to win re-election in 2018. <laughs> it's because even in traditionally blue states like yours and mine, see my state hasn't gone Republican for president since 1984. Put that in perspective, I was in high school in 1984. Since Ronald Reagan, Reagan won everything but the District of Columbia and, and Minnesota at that time. So even that, it's really even further back. Now, we've gotten close a couple times, but that's the last time we carried the state for Republican was when Reagan ran for re-election. So we are not a purple state, we are a blue state, at least when it comes to presidential elections. But we not only got me elected in 2010, retained in 2012, re-elected in 2014, but in each of those years, we added seats to our majorities in both houses of the legislature. Why? Because conservative reforms work. They work. In our state, just give me a couple, I'll give you a couple examples. In our state today, Wisconsin, in 2016, this year, we've got more people employed in the state of Wisconsin than at any point in the history of our state. Over three million people employed. The unemployment rate in our state, like a lot of other states led by Republicans over the last several years, has the lowest unemployment rate we've had in over 15 years. I always put that... I just put that in perspective. My boys are 21 and 22. The last time this unemployment rate was as low as it is now, they were five and six years old. That's like a lifetime ago for them. And the percentage of people working in our state is nearly 70%. Nationally, it's just over 62%. The lowest it's been since 1977. That's because Obama's policies are failing. Policies of Republican leaders, governors and lawmakers in states all across America are actually working. And the facts bear that out. I'm convinced that's why, in fact, I, I was reading one of the things about Larry's poll numbers here, you know, being over 70%. That's remarkable in any state. Yeah. That's remarkable not just in Maryland, that's remarkable in any state, even a red state. Governors typically don't get approval ratings that high. And one of the interesting conclusions of one of the pollsters who got asked about one of the stories I was reading was, that's not just the honeymoon of the first year, that's not just a, a little bit of goodwill because of his battles with cancer, which were remarkable in and of themselves. He said, enough time's passed, that's, that's no longer because of either of those things. That's just because people like what he's doing. Amen. And we like Larry, you know, fellow governors, we get a kick out of it. But we get a kick out of having a governor like Larry Hogan in a state like Maryland because we know that means there's hope for everyone across America. <laughs> but part of the reason why I wanted to be here tonight to help you all out is to make sure he's not there by himself. It was great to see a number of delegates and senators stand up before, but wouldn't it be nice? I know you went from being super majorities the other way, it would be nice to gradually get to a majority so you can not only have a Republican governor, you can have Republican majorities in both houses and then there's no end to the good that you can do for the people of the state of Maryland. And don't let anybody kid you into thinking you can't do that. My state hasn't gone Republican for president since 1984. But in Massachusetts, in Barack Obama's home state of Chicago, in, Las Vi in, in Nevada, in New Mexico. In fact, one of the best things, and it's odd for me to say this in front of a Republican crowd tonight, but I want to thank Barack Obama. <laughs> I do. Because one of the best recruiters for Republican candidates at the state level is President Barack Obama. 
In 2009, when he took office, the majority of governors in this country were Democrats. Today, there are 31 Republican governors, and by this fall, there may be as many as 35, an all-time high for Republicans. Since Barack Obama has been elected as president, because of his failed policies, voters across this country have said, we got to do something about that. Not just in Washington, but we got to do something at the state level. There have been nearly 1,000, nearly 1,000 Republican lawmakers elected to state bodies all across this country. In fact, you think back to that first that first year that he was president, 2009, again, a, the vast majority of state legislative bodies were controlled by Democrats. Today, there are 11 states that have Democrat control of the legislature, eight that are divided. All the rest are controlled by Republicans. How's that for turning things around after Barack Obama? And so it's appropriate being here Actually, I feel right at home. Not just because I four years ago I was at your great breakfast with the delegates. I was thinking about this, you know, on many different levels I feel at home. Not the least of which is you're all in the Big Ten now, so we appreciate that. <laughs> it's a little further from the Midwest than we used to think of it. Uh, Penn State was a long ways, but we love you in the Midwest, or sharing you in the Midwest with the Big Ten. We particularly like the uniforms. <laughs> By the way, we just started our new season. The Wisconsin Badgers are now wearing Under Armour, so you can appreciate that. That may be why we picked off LSU on Saturday night, so uh, we're particularly happy about that. Uh, but, uh, but not only that, and, and not just about all the great memories, but, but thinking tonight about this state being one of the originals. One of the original states. And why that's so important, and, and why you've got to elect a new member of the United States Senate who actually shares our values, why you've got to help elect new members to Congress who share these values, why you've got to help elect new members to this, both legislative bodies, and why we've got to do that elsewhere around the country, <coughs> is because this president didn't bring it up a few months ago on July 4th. I did, but I'm going to bring it up again tonight. And that is July 4th of this summer was the 240th anniversary of the founding of this great country. And when I think about folks here in Maryland and across the way in Virginia and all up and down the East Coast, when you think of the people who lived in the original United States, the founders of this country, they didn't just declare their independence on July 4th, years later after winning the Revolutionary War, those, many of those same founders said, we're going to spell out that this isn't just about declaring independence, that we are going to be a country founded on a simple principle, freedom. We're the only civilized country in the world that's foundation is about freedom. And the core of that was defined by those founders in the Constitution. And they felt so passionately about this. They didn't just spell out the branches of government. They spelled it out so clearly that they felt so passionately about it that they said not only are we going to lay out the framework, but we're going to add the Bill of Rights. We're going to spell out in detail what those freedoms are. The right to speech, the right to assembly, the freedom of, not from, religion. Something that was affirmed here in Maryland, where freedom of religion was really born, that sense of it right in this great state here. The right to keep and bear arms, the right to, to stand up for yourself. All those things were laid out, and then as if they wanted to send to future generations an explanation point about what they felt about the size and scope of the government, particularly at the federal level, they added the Tenth Amendment, which clearly in today's terms are simple as this. If it's not spelled out in the Constitution, it's the rights of the states and more importantly of the people. <laughs> what we have shown over the last seven and a half years it's not just that people were frustrated with the failed policies of this president and his allies in Washington. So much so that they elected some 1,000 new lawmakers. They elected an abundance of new governors. But more importantly, that those of us in office at the state level heard the message of the governed. We understood that the government's there to serve the people, not the other way around. That we've actually put... 
that we put in place positive reforms that have restored, restored our states. And now as we look ahead to the future, Kathy, for you and others who I hope you'll soon call colleagues, our hope is that when we get a Republican House and a Republican United States Senate and a Republican President in the White House, that we can once and for all have Republicans leading in our nation's capital who understand what our founders intended. And that was power should not rest in the federal government. It should go back to the states and ultimately back to the hands of the American people. Now some may say that's, that's a pretty heavy task out there. And there's no doubt it is. But I hope, in the little taste you saw the protesters tonight, I hope you'll see that for us in Wisconsin, where we had a few more than the ones we saw outside, <laughs> at one point we didn't just have 150,000 protesters, they were in and around the Capitol, they were around the governor's residence. My kids at the time were both in a public high school in Wauwatosa, about an hour from the Capitol where we raised our children. Every night they'd have to come back home to that. We had a trooper out in front, but you know there were days when they would actually be diverted and go over to the mall and do their homework upstairs in the food court because they couldn't come because the street was blocked off with all the protesters in front of the house. They were targeted on Facebook and other social medias out there. I had a stack of death threats about this high off the ground. Some were so vivid. My wife got one once that was directed to her, told her that There'd never been a governor assassinated in the state of Wisconsin, but maybe my time had come. And it was so vivid, it actually told her she still works part time for the Lung Association. It told her where she went in the door at, where my kids went to school, where my then father in law lived. There was another one that was sent to me via a, a, a telegraphic message that one of the Capitol Police brought to my attention that it was so vivid, it actually said that if I didn't back off, they were going to gut my wife like a deer. I mean, this was the kind of stuff that, and it wasn't just me, it was our lawmakers, too. I mean, one of our state senators on the western half of the state of Wisconsin near La Crosse came, or his wife actually came home one night. She was an emergency room nurse. She pulled in late at night, the lights were off, and the tires popped on her car because they had put nails all over the driveway going into, into the spot that went back to their, their garage in the back of their house. Horrific stories, awful circumstances. But the good news is I can tell you five years after, we didn't just make it through, we thrived. Not just politically, certainly it was great to win my recall and for the others to win the recall and to gain majorities again and expand those in 12 and 14 along the way. But better off, our state is thriving. Our schools are doing better. Our budgets are balanced. Our economy is doing better than ever. <coughs> our local governments actually control the things that they do. And I know that we can do it not just in my state, I know that we can do it all across the country. As a kid, I loved history. Absolutely loved history. My parents didn't make a whole lot of money. My dad was a preacher. My mom, as was mentioned, worked part-time as a bookkeeper. And so usually our trips were within a day or so of our house. So I never got to go out to Washington or the East Coast anywhere here until I was older. <coughs> but I always loved reading about our founders. It's a little bit geeky. I, I think I thought of them almost as bigger than life, almost like superheroes. And so years ago, long after I had grown, I got a chance, and I really wanted more than anything to go to Constitution Hall in Philadelphia. Because thinking about these founders as being so over the top, I wanted to see where they had done that work, both of the Declaration and, and the work done building up to the Constitution. And so. I went there early in the morning with my wife. We went out with the National Park Service. The sun was coming up. I walked in and I thought, my, this is gonna be, this is gonna be unbelievable. As we looked around, we realized it wasn't very big. And I looked at the desk and I looked at the chairs and look around here tonight, they weren't much different than the ones you're sitting in, a little bit older, but uh, they weren't that much different. And it dawned on me. These were ordinary people. Ordinary people who sat in these chairs at these desks. Ordinary people who'd done something quite extraordinary. You see, you think of 
of those delegates from here in Maryland and across the way in Virginia and all throughout this coast. The, the leaders of this country, they weren't just people who risked their political careers. They weren't people who just risked their business ventures. These were people who risked their lives for the very freedoms we hold dear today. There's been Franklin that said we, we must all hang together or we'll hang separately. That's literally what was at risk. See, moments like that remind me that not just in our past, but in our future, the history we're going to make, that what has made America great, what has made us exceptional, what has made us the greatest country in the history of the world, has been in moments of crisis. There have been men and women of courage who have been willing to think more more about the future of their children and their grandchildren than they thought about their own futures. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, here tonight in Maryland and across this great country, this again is one of those moments in American history. This is one of those times where we're going to step back and look to the future and say, what are we going to tell future generations? What are we going to tell our children and our grandchildren that we were willing to do to ensure that freedom was still there for each and every one of them. I'm an optimist. I believe we're gonna have a grand story to tell many generations to come. It's gonna be because of good people like you in this room supporting great candidates here and across America. Thank you so much for coming out today.